name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Turn, please, to uh, 1 Peter chapter 3. And... Uh, I'd actually, actually like to start with verse 8, if you don't mind. 1 Peter 3, verse 8. Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful or full of pity. Be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrariwise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto, thereunto called that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good and everything I've just read is summed up in this last phrase let him seek peace and ensue it everything from verse 8 through verse 11 is summed up in the last phrase let him seek peace and ensue it the Amplified says of verse 11, let him turn away from wickedness and shun it. No, 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 no. no. I'm going to read a little bit. You're, you've been sitting a while. Amplified says, beginning with verse 8, finally, all of you should be of one and the same mind, united in spirit, sympathizing with one another, loving each the others as brethren of one household. Compassion. Compassionate and courteous, tender hearted and humble minded. Never return evil for evil or insult for insult, scolding, tongue lashing, berating, but on the contrary, blessing. Praying for the welfare, happiness, and protection, and truly pitying and loving them. For know that to, to this you have been called, that you may yourselves inherit a blessing from God. Obtain a blessing as heirs, bringing welfare and happiness and protection. For let him who wants to enjoy life and see good days, good whether apparent or not, keep his tongue free from evil and his lips from guile, treachery, deceit. Let him turn away from wickedness and shun it. And let him do right. Let him search for peace. Let him search for peace, harmony, undisturbedness from fears, agitating passions and moral conflicts, and seek it eagerly. Do not merely desire peaceful relationships with God, with your fellow man, and with yourself, but pursue and go after it. Live a New Testament. Of course, it's not a translation, it's a paraphrase. But verse 8 says, and now this word to all of you. You should be like one big happy family, full of sympathy toward each other, loving one another with tender hearts and humble minds. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't snap back at those who say unkind things about you. Instead, pray for God's help for them. For we are to be kind to others, and God will bless us for it. I think we just heard that. For if you want a happy, good life, keep control of your tongue. If you want a happy, good life, keep control of your tongue. You mean a lot of the folks that go around claiming to have the Holy Ghost that haven't had a, any real joy in so long that the, it's a direct result not of their circumstances but of their own tongue? 
If you want a happy, good life, keep control of your tongue and guard your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Try to live in peace even if you must run after it to catch and hold it. Hallelujah. God bless you. You may be seated. Amen. This is part B of yesterday. And uh, I apologize if for whatever reason you weren't able to be here. I don't, I'm not, I don't have the time to catch you, catch you up. So hopefully this will be relevant to you otherwise. Um, the Lord has called us to peace. That's our calling. Peace. To be at peace between us and God, to be at peace between us and others, and to be at peace with ourselves. God has called us to peace. He's called us to peace by the preaching of the gospel of peace. That's, that's what the Word of God says, the gospel of peace. The gospel, of course, is good news. And peace is good news. And there's good news, you can have peace. I have been known as a very intense person. This is not true. I am not intense. Intense means your intention. I am a focused person. Sometimes that focus has put me under pressure, but it wasn't intensity. I don't want to be intense. I do want to be focused. The Lord has said to me, and I'm going to share this with you today, really what I'm, you know, most of what I teach is just answers I tried to get to survive for myself. That, things I had to receive just to be able to be saved, come close to being saved. Because without them, I couldn't be saved. And so, uh, I'm not preaching at you about this stuff. This is stuff God's talking to me about that I'm trying to learn to live. Okay? But uh, I've been very focused. And in that focused condition, I have put a lot of pressure on myself. And uh, without intending to do so consciously, I've put a lot of pressure on other people. There's a difference between conviction and pressure. Conviction says, this is the way I want you to live, but you can't produce this. So instead of trying to do it, you need to yield to me so that I can do it through you. Pressure says, you better get this right, boy. There's one verse that I've been trying to let the Lord teach me, and I still don't have it down. And that is the number one principle of fruitfulness. And it is a parallel of yesterday's number one principle of fruitfulness. Yesterday's was, except a grain of wheat fall on the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. The parallel of that, which is the same principle stated in a different way, Jesus said, concerning fruitfulness, without me ye can do nothing. I personally have lived much of my life uh, attempting to disprove that. I didn't know that's what I was doing. But everything I try to do within my own strength is an attempt, whether consciously or otherwise, to disprove the statement. The greatest curse that anyone could experience in their lives is to have success through their own strength. The greatest curse is for things to work when you're using your personality, your ability, your intellect. If you can make stuff happen through your flesh, you're cursed. You're cursed. The Bible says it. Jeremiah blessed is the man that trust uh, or cursed is the man that trusteth in man maketh flesh his arm that's cursed 
whatever I'm doing through my own strength is not only cursed, but I'm cursed because of it. Because if I succeed, it only reinforces that that's the way I'm supposed to do it. Which brings me farther and farther away from trusting God. What the Lord is trying to teach me is He has not called me to live in pressure. He's called me to live in peace. He's called me to have peace, not pressure. I quoted or read the verse to you yesterday that says, Jesus said, uh, uh, I've come to give you peace. In the world, you're going to have tribulation, Greek word thalipsis, which is pressure. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. He said, I'm going to put you continually in situations that cause you pressure. But it is never by will for you to internalize that pressure and put it upon yourself that somehow you've got to solve it, you've got to fix it, you've got to do something about it. It is my will for you to continually take the pressure and give it to me. Why? Because pressure produces frustration. And frustration produces weariness. And weariness is the antidote to revival. Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you shall reap. If you don't get weary, give up and quit. So what does the devil do if he wants to keep the church from having revival? He doesn't have to cause sin. He doesn't have to cause, he doesn't have to cause a, a division. All the devil has to do to keep you from being fruitful and your church from having a revival is to cause the, the preacher from the preacher down people to take all of the problems and the cares of life and the responsibilities and the desire to do good and see things happen upon themselves and internalize it and make it their responsibility and they've got to cause it to happen through their own strength and intellect and personality and plan, etc., etc. And he knows that regardless of what success you're able to produce or, or what kind of results, you're not, not always the same success or result, uh, what kind of results you're able to produce, it, through that, it's only a matter of time. Let me tell you something. The reason so many pastors get burnt out is that you can't pastor what flesh is produced. You can't pastor what flesh is produced. Every tree your heavenly father hasn't planted, he's going to root up. So that means if my flesh, through my personality, got them in the building, through my cute little schemes, through my little deals, I get them in the building, and, and, and through my flesh, I, I scare them to death so they come down and, and pray a little bit, and talk in tongues a little bit. But as was said yesterday, God doesn't participate in shotgun weddings. The Lord said, I never accepted them. You got them in, but I never accepted them in. Now when they come with their problems, there's no grace and anointing to help them with a the problem. So you carry those kind of loads yourself, and after a while, you get so worn out. And why do we do that? Now, I, I'm not picking on anybody here, honestly. This man knows I love him, and... And I love him. I, I, I love these, these guys are my friends. And I, you know, not a lot of people have enough courage to give me a microphone. You know, not, there's not a lot of guys that have a, that kind of courage. You, you, you got it. But the problem is, Guys, get in that condition because of the pressure to stop being the little guy. That's right. That's right. Well, what do you do with a guy that's had some results 
by other people's standards that still feels like the little guy inside. I've had guys tell me, Brother Wright, you don't know who you are. Oh, yes, I do. You know, you're the one who don't know who I am. You've got your perception, perception of who I am. That's why I said yesterday, I'm, I'm a home missionary. That makes me a little guy, apparently. And I feel like a little guy. But the Lord's trying to teach me this. Results has nothing to do with all of that. Greatness has nothing to do with the size of the church. Greatness has to do with how devoted you are to finding and doing the will of God every day. There is nothing else that's success. I mean, the Savior of the world is walking the face of the earth and, and, and heathen come up to Him and want to be dealt with. And he says... I'm not dealing with you. I'm just dealing with the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But the world's going to hell. It's not my problem. Let me tell you something. I spent years do, doing everything I could do till one day I saw what Jesus did. If, if my job is to reach the whole world by myself, I can't find any example in that from Jesus. Jesus wasn't trying to reach the whole world. He got up every day to find the will of the Father and do it. If any flesh had the ability to do anything through its own strength and ability, his flesh did. But this is what he said about his own flesh. The Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do he does and I'm paraphrasing here and what he hears the father say he says that was Jesus's method of operation for his day period wherever you're going father that's where I'm going Whatever you're doing father that's what I'm doing whatever you're saying father that's what I'm saying Period. End of discussion. That's success. Some sow, some water. God gives the increase. So if God's given the increase, I, I, my freshman and sophomore years of high school were spent in Rhode Island. Dad was in the Navy 30 years. He was stationed there. And in, they if you've ever been to that area of the country, they have the most beautiful stone fences that go for mile after mile after mile surrounding every field. Do you know why they have those beautiful stone fences? Because they had to do they had to do something with the stones that they had to dig out of the ground to even be able to grow crops to survive. It wasn't fertile soil. They had to dig stones out of the ground, and you got all these stones. What do you do with them? Well, we might as well make fences out of them. We got to do something with them because we can't grow crops in a field with this much stone in it. Well, you know what? If you had two farmers that took raw land, one in Rhode Island and one in some bottom land down here in Louisiana or wherever that's just, the dirt's just as black as it can be someplace and you give them both five years to see which one's going to have the most productive farm same amount of work same amount of effort same amount of knowledge same amount of skill you're going to have two completely different results One's going to spend two or three years just eking out survival, just trying to get enough stone out of the ground so that he can plant some crops. Oh God, somehow, 
somehow somebody has got to leave this place free from your your definition of what God is expecting out of you has got to completely change you, it's not it's not the re, it's not results it's not numbers Do, how many people I want to see saved I'm going to put myself in Abraham's category with you here okay is that alright okay no problem 75 years old pastor in a church 75 years old don't have any kids get up to church one day and announce the Lord has spoken to me my wife and I are going to have a baby she's 65 barren never had any kids I'm 75 and God has said that he's going to give us a child and from now on I don't want you to call me pastor so and so I want you to call me pastor who is now father of many nations you talk about the buzz that's going to come buzz there's a buzz going to go through that congregation you know what this old we need to get us a young pastor because this old man's got problems he's living in delusion and you know it's the truth we don't have any problem preaching about those people but if anybody today had their kind of faith you're not going to be invited to preach camp meetings. You're going to be branded as weird and eccentric and you're out there. Oh, praise God. So I just changed my mind. I'm not telling you what I'm believing for in Annapolis because you wouldn't accept it. No, I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not baiting you. I'm just not going to do it. Let's suffice it to say, okay, it's not what we're running now. It's a lot more. How? How? How's that going to be? I'll tell you how it's going to be. God has been teaching me how it's going to happen. It's impossible. It's impossible to see what I'm believing for. I have spent all these years learning. I can't do it. I don't have the personality. I don't have the ministry. I don't have the ability. I don't have the intellect to produce what God said He's going to do. So what is He trying to do? He's trying to teach me how to get out of the way so He can do it. Seek peace and pursue it. Peace. Peace is a wonderful thing. Peace is a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing. The Bible says, casting all your care upon Him because He cares for you. Why? Why care? Why do I need to, to excuse the terminology, religiously, devotedly, focused, Every day, cast all my care upon the, all my care. What, what is a care? Anything that's important enough for, to me to think about twice? Can I get there? Just, just hang on. All right? I, I'm, I'm going there. I know I'm not getting there as fast as you want me to, but I'm going. I'm going. I really am. brothers that's right why do I need to give him care my cares because according to the parable of the sower there are three things that keep planted seed from coming to fruitfulness love of riches love of pleasures and the cares of this life now frankly the percentage of us who are truly unfruitful because of love of pleasure and love of riches is really a relatively small percentage, really. I mean, you think about it. As large of an organization as we've got, you take any, any group of people, the Lions Club, the Elks Club, the Moose Lodge, uh, the Veteran of Foreign Wars, in any particular group of people, the percentage of those people who would be money hungry or full of lust and, 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 and roving eyes would be a far higher percentage than our group. I mean, that, that proves how, how much God works among us because it's really, you know, really. Because if there's that many money-hungry people among us, we're a bunch of failures because there's not many of us that got what we're hungry for.
And while I can't speak about the lust thing, I know one thing. I may be old, but I'm not dead. And I'm very thankful that I'm happily married to Jesus and my wife. Because, but for the grace of God goes me and you and all of us. But for the most part, the people I know and fellowship with are pure, pure spirited people. They may be humans, but they're, they've got a right spirit. They love God. Doesn't mean they're not interested in that other. They just want to do it like God wants it to be done. So what is the thing that's keeping the body of Christ from being so fruitful? What is it? Let me tell you something. You and I know that if we're greedy, we need to repent for that. My God, my God, my God, my God. Here it comes. You ready? You ready? Here, here, here it comes. We know if we're greedy, we need to repent for that. We know if we've got lust and we're battling lust, we're in danger of losing our souls. We better get down to business and find a way to get victory over this lust. But do you know how many of us that don't think it's any big deal that our lives and minds and hearts and spirits are full of worry and full of fear and carry all kind of pressure and problems and weights? And we don't think anything of it. We don't think there's anything wrong with that. My God, my God, my God, my God. We need to pray here just a minute. Some of us need a revelation that it's just as wrong in the sight of God for you to carry your cares and not give it to Him as it is to be greedy and lustful. Come on, we need to pray right now. We need a revelation. We need a revelation. The devil's got this down pat. He knows that with the Holy Ghost, we're pretty sensitive to, to, the, to greed and its dangers. And we're, we're really sensitive to lust and its dangers. But we're just totally oblivious or ignoring the danger of carrying our cares. It's not our lust that's keeping us from being fruitful. It's not, our, it's not our greed that's keeping us from being fruitful. That's such a small percentage of us that that it fits. What it, the one it fits, the, almost all of us, is our cares. Casting. Casting our cares upon Him. Because He cares for us. Casting our cares. 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 How often, how often do I need to do this? Every time throughout the day, it comes on me, and my mind and my mind gets gets a little trouble over anything. My spirit gets a little agitated when that disturbance of my mind comes and the agitation of my spirit comes. I have just admitted it's a care, and the next second I continue trying to think about it and figure it out and work it out and wonder how it's going to come about, rather than saying Jesus. I don't know the future and I don't know how to fix this. I give this to you because I can't do anything about it. Oh, what a relief. Oh, what a relief. What a relief. Oh, it's just Brother Wright again, his extremism. Really? Let me tell you something. You know what? I, I, let's go back. Let's go to, uh, again. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6. Listen to, what it, listen to it. Be careful for nothing. The word nothing in the Greek means not even one thing. It's a strong word. Nothing. No thing. Nothing. What do you mean by that, brother, right? Anything that crossed my mind the second time that begins to produce any kind of agitation of my mind or disturbance in my spirit is a care. And He wants me to give it to Him. He doesn't want us carrying all this weight. Lay aside every weight and the sin. You know what? Do you know how many of us fall into sin? Not because we want to sin, but because we're so weary from carrying our cares. We're so weary. 
We're so worn out mentally, emotionally, spiritually from carrying our own cares that when temptation comes along, we don't have the strength to overcome it. Lay aside every weight and the sin. The sin comes after the weight. What's a weight? It's a care. It's a care. It's a care. Let's pray right now. Let's pray. Let's pray. Come on, let's pray. Come on. Come on. Come on. You know what? Don't, don't, don't stop praying. You know what? I acknowledge to you to live like this. You've got to have a closer relationship with God than you've ever had before. Isn't that the idea? It's the idea. If I want to get closer to Jesus, I've got to remove the things that are between me and Him. I'm going to tell you something. More than sin between me and Him, it's the cares that I'm keeping and not giving to Him that are between me and Him. That's what's between me and Him. You know what? If I don't live like this, do you know how many verses there are in the Bible that don't appear, that appear not to be true? They're not true. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls but I believe I don't want to get the theologist Paul said in Hebrews that's my opinion Paul said in Hebrews he that has entered into his rest has ceased not from his sin he that has entered into his rest has ceased from his own works can I say own efforts depending on his own strength Yeah, because that's the only way that verse makes sense. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Yoke is easy and his burden is light. What am I carrying between he, that, that's between he and I? Martha was so cumbered with serving. She was so weary. Every, all the crowd came and Mary had been traveling with them and they all come in the house and Mary, Mary, Mary should be in the kitchen helping, but she's not. She's sitting at the feet of Jesus where you always find Mary. And she's sitting there still. One more question, Jesus. One more question. She's been out there traveling. Well, why would she do that at home? Because out there she's having to share him with all the men or whatever. And apparently the disciples are outside or someplace. I, we don't know where they are. They're not even mentioned in the scripture. So he, here's an opportunity. She gets him to herself. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. She ought to be in the kitchen helping. She ought to be serving Oh, let me tell you something. When your serving gets in the way of your relationship with God, that doesn't please God. That word serve there in the Greek is di diakonia, which is the same exact word from which we get the word servant, the servant of the Lord. It speaks of serving God or ministry. When your ministry gets in the way of relationship, you're not pleasing God. When you're visiting the hospital and you're counseling and your and your administration and all of that stuff, when you're so busy serving God that you don't have time for the good part, doesn't please God. Doesn't please God. Let's pray again. Let's pray. In Jesus name. Jesus name. Jesus name. Oh, what griefs we, oh, what peace we often forfeit. That's what you're saying. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Oh, because we do not carry what? What? How many years have we been singing that song? Everything. Everything. I don't always have to get on my knees to do that. Sometimes I ride down the road and say, Lord, I release this to you. I release this to you. I don't know what to do with this. Here, take it, take it. Here, God, have this. You can have this. Take this, take this, take this, take this, take this. Because I know me. I'm hard-headed and I'm stubborn and I'm self-sufficient. 
put those three things together, they're the enmity, they're enmity against God because it's carnality. That's the definition of carnality. It's not sin. It's dependence upon flesh to do spiritual things. Carnality is not living in sin. Carnality is depending upon flesh to do spiritual things. And the carnal mind is enmity with God. And it cannot please God. The word cannot there in the Greek means it does not have the ability. Not didn't want to talk about lack of desire. The carnal mind can desire to please God, but it doesn't have the ability to please God. Because it depends on flesh. Because it's not pleasing to God to do spiritual stuff through the strength of the flesh. That does not please God. I'm not faulting you. I've done it. I've tried it. No, no, go back to Philippians. Look at this. Be careful. Be full of care, anxiety, worry, fear for nothing. Absolutely nothing. But in how much? I can't hear you. Does that leave anything out? Let me tell you something the Lord's been working on me about. You know, I said to you yesterday that, uh, you know, that the Lord's been talking about this, talking to me about this desire for control. When, when, when he's tried to talk to me about this in the past, I've quoted to him all the stuff I, I have delegated and given up. I mean, I can't tell you right now who's in my Sunday school classes. I don't know who my head teachers are. I've got a, I've got a superintendent that I've trusted, and all he does is clear with me. Uh, uh, I'd like so-and-so to be in Sunday school. Fine. He puts them where he wants them. I don't ask. I don't need to know. i got other things to think about. I trust people, not job descriptions. I give it up. <clears throat> we got these 12 congregations. Some of you have met Brother Mike You, I'm not the bishop. He's the bishop. I provide the authority. He does all the work. And I give, all, give this, this list to God. Look, Lord, I'm, I'm not a control freak. I give this up, give this up, give this up, give this up, give this up. Lord, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not a control freak. No, no. I don't mind trusting God and others with the work of God, with the lost, with this, with that, and the other. But the bottom line comes out of this. The Lord said, oh, yes, you are. You're the servant who spent all day doing my work and who comes in from the field and says, that was your time. This is mine. my time you ever use that term oh God's working on that my time you see if the Lord wants me to work 18 hours a day no big deal happy to do it Lord you want me to work 20 hours a day give it to you Lord as long as you, just give me a half hour that I control today that I don't have to ask you what I wanted, what you want me to do during this time just I want part of my day I can control Yeah. That doesn't fit anybody here, I'm sure, but it's me. He says, and you want what from me? Oh, I want all of you, Jesus. Oh, really? And I should give myself to someone? I was talking to a man one time. He told me this story. He said the Lord was talking to him about trust. He said, the Lord told me that trusting God is like a father who is walking two small sons, one holding one by each hand, and walks him up to a curb. And the father says to the sons, let's wait here, there's a car coming. One son pulls his hand loose from the father, bolts out in the street, and at the last second, the father has to jump out there and rescue that child. And the man said, the Lord told me I'm like that son that I've boasted about how many times he's rescued me at the last second when all I've acknowledged is I haven't been trusting the Father. All these, hey, you know what that fit me? I can tell you about the last second rescues in my life. I have a long inventory of them. 
But the other son, his hand peacefully, without attempting to influence the father, stays in the father's hand. You know what? That boy doesn't even know whether there's a car coming or not. He's not looking for the car. He's watching the father. The father stops. He stops. The father starts across the street. He goes across the street. That boy does one thing and one thing only. He devotes himself to keeping his hand in the hand of the father. Moving when the father moves and not moving when the father doesn't move. And the man said to me, the Lord said, which one of these two sons do you think I'm going to trust my greatest promises to? The one that's always rushing out there doing his own thing, I have to rescue him? Or the one that's not even interested in the promise except whatever glorifies me, all he's interested in is just staying in step with me. Thank you. As many as I come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and I will how do I get that rest? I can't even drink without baptizing myself. <laughs> and I'll give you what? <clears throat> How do I get rest? How do we get rest? Take. I'm not going to put it on you. If it's going to get on you, you're going to take the yoke. Like... Why should I cast all my cares on God? There's something He gave me a good brain. There's some things I can figure out for myself. I don't have to pray about everything. I think this, what you're preaching, preacher, is too restricting. You mean like a yoke? Take my yoke upon you. In other words, I'm already in the other side of the yoke. And this side of the yoke is empty. I'm inviting anyone that wants to have this kind of relationship with me to put their head in the yoke and join themselves up with me. And you know what? I've read this. I don't know if it's true, but I'm telling you what I read. The strong seasoned oxen is in the, in the right side of the yoke. The young, not as strong oxen, less experienced oxen is in the left side of the yoke. Right? The, you, know, you know the job of the oxen on the left side? Because of the, the opening of the yoke, as long as it's parallel or perpendicular to their necks, it's comfortable. Burden, easy. Or yoke is easy. Burden is light. Right? Right? But if one gets ahead or behind the other, the yoke becomes twisted. The effective size of the yoke decreases and pinches into the necks of both. And the burden ceases to be light and the yoke ceases to be easy because one got ahead or behind the other. So when he invited me in the yoke, he took all my pressures and responsibilities off me and he gave me one job. Go at the pace I go. Let me set the direction and you just walk with me in that direction. Don't go faster than me. Don't go slower than me. You don't have to worry about where we're going. You don't have to worry about heavy, how heavy the load is. I'll carry the load. I'll pull all the load. I'll pull all the weight of it. You won't have to pull any of the weight of it. You won't have to pull any of the weight. You won't have to worry about where we're going, what we're doing. All you have to do is just keep your eye on me. And keep up. Don't try to get me to go faster than it's time for me to go. Don't try to make me go slower than I'm ready to go. Don't make me try to turn left when I want to go right and vice versa. Just stay in step with me. Do you know how easy our lives would be if that just became our focus? It's not, 
how am I going to make this next church payment? Anybody here ever said that? I have. How am I going to make this next church payment? Boy, you know how many times I squeeze that church payment out at the last second as he jerked me out of the street. But there, there came a place in time where I realized that, best, that I, couldn't, I couldn't live like that. I couldn't carry the weight of that church payment every, like, every month like that. And all I did was trust him. And it got to the place I didn't even have to worry about whether the payment was there or not. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because, all because, all because we do not carry everything in God in prayer. In these last couple of minutes, let me talk to you about the pond of peace. This is just a little mental image that God has given me to help me. I, as I said yesterday, I, I, I love photography and uh, some of my most Some of the scenes I'm most excited about shooting is when you can find water that's really still and gives you a perfect reflection. I, I was on a golf course one day. I know that probably sends me to hell in some eyes, but that's okay. I, um, I, I pray on the golf course, and so I guess that makes it a little okay. <laughs> Lord, forgive me. I my anger. For <laughs> right. I was on a golf course one day, and I had, sometimes I carry my little... Uh, a little pocket camera with me in case there's an interesting shot and and I was at this one particular green and just off the left of this green was a beautiful pond and there was a house there was nothing spectacular about the house but the water was perfectly still and I whipped out that camera took a couple of shots and when I got them back from the developer I was amazed I took that picture I said which is the real and which is the image which is the real and which is the image and people would turn that picture upside down and they'd turn it again and turn it again and they'd say, this is the real. Nah, that's the image. See? And I'd point out the couple of things so you could see which was the real and which was the image. Because that pond was so peaceful. It perfectly reflected. I need to seek peace and pursue it. Because it's not me people need to see. They need to see the perfect reflection of Jesus in my life. And the smallest pebble thrown into the stillest pond causes enough ripples to make the image less clear. It makes it less clear. It makes it less clear. Seek peace and pursue it. Paul said, ye are dead and your lives are hid with Christ and God. What does that mean? It means that I have so surrendered not just my life, my, my ministry, my time, my health, my day, my hour, my minute, my second, my moment to God. That it's not me anymore at all. And my, in, my, my concern is not how well I preach and who's going to be impressed and invite me to come. Or my concern isn't doing enough work to get the numbers up so that I can be known enough in the district that my name will be on a nominating ballot for something. Hey, I'm not 27. I'm 57. Some things I used to suspicion some things I've experienced and know. And my God, to live this kind of life, you can't have but one motive. Glorify Jesus. Why? Because whoever does the work gets the credit. And that's the reason I don't cash cares on the Lord. Because everything I can do, 
I get to take the credit for. I get the praise and the glory for it. But everything I give to him that he does something with or takes care of, I, can't, I don't have any choice but say, he did it. He did it. I didn't do it. He did it. He did it. It's his glory. It's his praise. Be, be, be careful for nothing but in everything. In the situation. In. It's a fixed position. A relational rest. The situation you find yourself in. Surrounded by. In everything. By. By is a preposition of agency. This is how you do it. By prayer and supplication. Prayer is conversation. Supplication has got some emotion to it. So I'm casting my care on the Lord. If I don't have any emotion, I'm just conversating with the Lord. Lord, this is a, this is a concern. This is a problem. I'm caring. This, here you have it. Then there's other things where I got some emotion involved. Lord Jesus, this is really hurting. This is really, this feels really bad, God. I give it, I give it to you. I give it to you. And I pray in supplication until it's gone. But it's with thanksgiving. The word with there means in the presence of or accompanied by. Because if I leave off the thanksgiving, I'm not surrendering stuff. I'm just complaining. I'm not praying. I'm not trusting. I'm just complaining. But when I'm, when I'm surrendering everything by prayer and supplication, the thanksgiving proves that I know that God is in control. We believe that His children will not be forsaken. It's too high. God's in control. God's in control. God's in control. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Your requests. But like yesterday, I make my requests, but implied in my request is, this is what I'd like to see, Lord. This is what I'd like to happen. But nevertheless, not my will. Lord, this is what I'd, I want, but if... If you, you, your way is always better than mine, and if this isn't your will, just let, let, let's just let, let's just settle this right now, Lord. This is what I'd like, but if this is not your will, your will is definitely better than mine. So I'm asking this, but I just want you to know, uh, I'm not fighting if you got another way, because I, I want to go with your way. Next verse, please. And the peace of God which surpasses and is superior to. That's the word. Passeth. What does that mean? Like on Interstate 55? No. It surpasses. It's superior to understanding. I don't have to have the answers. I don't have to know what he's going to do. I don't have to know how he's going to fix it. All I've got to have is peace. All I've got to do is give it to him. I don't have to know how it's going to turn out. I, 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 don't, I don't know how it's going to I don't have to know how it's going to turn out I don't know I don't have to know how long it's going to go on I don't have to know when it's going to happen I don't even have to know if it's going to happen all I need is peace because peace is superior to understanding I don't need him to answer the question why I've got some ideas on why our building fell. I've had others come and tell me why the building fell. You know what? All of those things may be correct, but none of them, knowing doesn't give me peace. The building's still on the ground. You know? Just, just, just remember this. What I taught yesterday, what I'm teaching today, you know, you can take it or leave it. It can help you or not help you. But when I go home, I'm going home to a slab. It's still going to be a collapsed building. I still don't know what I'm going to do for a building when I get home. So it's not a possibility. It's not a question of just teaching something and going on about my life. I don't have any choice but to go home and live this. Because the building's still on. This, well, it's not even on the ground anymore. It's gone. I don't. It's not going to put that building back if he, he tells me why. Why did my son die? Why did my wife die? My husband died? Why, why did this, why this happen? It doesn't fix anything to know why. Your life's not going to get better. You're not going to get more spiritual. You're not going to live for God better because he tells you why. 
All I got to have is peace. I just have to have peace. And the peace of God which passeth or surpasses is superior to all understanding. All understanding. If God set me down to explain everything about His plan over this situation, it's the building is still on the ground. I still have to find peace with the fact that it's gone. It's gone. Shall keep. The word there, keep, guard, preserve, garrison. It's your protection. Peace is my protection from the pressures, problems, and pain of life. It's what protects me. Peace guards my heart and mind. So my mind, peace guards my mind so the devil can't come and question God. And peace guards my heart so that I don't get bitter. What did Jesus say to John in the jail? He said to John, blessed is he that's not offended in me. Blessed is he that's not offended in the way I run his life. What is that to thee? Follow thou me. That's right. Yeah. Let's pray. Can we pray? You know what I really, I, I, my personal hope is, I don't know what all God's purpose is and all this, He didn't tell me. You know what, while you're praying, you know what my, my hope is really today, from what you've heard from my part from today and, and yesterday, not that you got all of this, but that you've heard enough to want to go home and get your concordance out and read every verse in the Bible on peace. I, I, I feel like that from my, from my perspective, I will have had some impact if, if nothing else happens but you just go home and read the, every verse on peace and, and the context of it and say Lord what have I been missing here I'm 57 years old I've had the Holy Ghost almost 46 years I didn't know all this stuff about peace he's been trying to teach me he's been trying to teach me but I haven't been willing to let go he said he wouldn't let anything come upon us listen while you're praying listen he said he wouldn't let anything come upon us greater than we could bear. That means inherent in every care and problem is the, is the innate tendency to go right to the one that allowed it to come if I just let go. And the mental picture there is someone with a bouquet of helium-filled balloons. All I have to do is take the string loose from the rest and just open my hand and release it and it goes right to the heavens. Every care, problem, trouble that's in your life, He has already edited it and put within it the nature to want to come to Him if you just turn it loose. It has inherently built into it the desire to go to the one greater than if I just won't keep holding on to it and turn it loose. Why don't you stand and just, let's practice just a little bit. Just for a few minutes. You don't have to say it out loud. It may be personal. But let's practice a little bit. What, what kind of care did you bring in here? The Bible says you can't, you can't bring burdens into the temple and, and leave with them. When you come to the temple, you're supposed to leave your burdens here. You're not supposed to go out the way you came in. Come on. You don't have to say it loud. Jesus, I take such and such and give it to you. I release it to you, Lord. I take this and release it to you. I can't carry this. I can't fix that. I can't take care of this. This worry, this fear, this problem, this difficulty. I give it to you, Jesus. I give it to you, Jesus. I give it to you, Jesus. I give you my house. I give you my whys. I give you my whens. I give you my whats. I give you my who's. I give them to you, Jesus. I give you my where's. I give them to you, Jesus. I give all my how, how and who and what and where and when's. I give them to you, Jesus. Come on, just another moment or two. Some of you got to do this enough just to begin to feel that it really does work before you go do it on your own. 
This is the lifestyle of peace. This is the way of peace that I talked about yesterday. The way of peace. We've been called to live in the way of peace. The lifestyle of peace. We're called of God to live the lifestyle of peace. Come on, another, just another moment. Just another moment. Just, just one more moment, could you? Come on, some of you is some of you's weighing this in the balance. You haven't really tried it yet. Because you're afraid that if you release it to God, He's not going to do it like you want it done. I can't guarantee you that what you give to Him, He's going to do, do it like you want it done. But I promise you this. If you truly trust Him with it, He'll do it like you can't imagine it being done. It'll turn out better than you could have even dreamed it being. Hallelujah, hallelujah.